Good afternoon and welcome again to the Norman Rockwell Museum. My name is Tom Daly. I'm the education curator for the museum. And we put together a talk that's looking at Norman Rockwell's images of adventure. So we're going to do literal adventure and then maybe some theoretical adventure. So it should be a fun talk. It's, uh, it's something we've done a couple times this week. Uh, so it should be pretty good at by this point. And I'll definitely encourage you, if you have questions, to raise your hand. Happy to answer any questions that you have. And uh, we're going to get started uh, right now. Actually, the image that's on the screen at the moment is actually Rockwell's Clipper Club uh, certificate. And you received that from Pan Am uh, World Airways if you flew around the world, which Rockwell certainly did in 1955. I'm um, doing illustrations for that airline and making sure that people had a sense of how small the world had become. So we'll be looking at those images in just a couple of minutes, but just to offer a little bit of context, Rockwell started his career with the Saturday Evening Post if we're looking at Post magazines in 1916. So on the streets of America at that point, you probably would have seen maybe some sleds and some carriages. You would have definitely seen a train or two, not that many automobiles, um, probably no ships. There weren't a lot of ships on roads at that time, but they certainly were using ships to, at sea, as Rockwell was familiar with. And then as Rockwell's career would progress on, he would end up illustrating images for the space program. So Rockwell really had the opportunity to take a look at the entire 20th century and show us our part of that century. And we'll start at the beginning here. So I like to start anyway. We see Norman Rockwell's mom and dad. Uh, mom has a kitten in her lap there. Mr. Rockwell is the one with the white tie. His brother Jarvis, who's kind of the superstar of the family, is the one with the darker bow tie standing up. And I say that because Norman Rockwell's brother, Jarvis, was the one that invented a toy that probably all of you played with at some point. And that's a round disc that has a dowel in it with colored circles that graduate up to the smallest size on the top. Um, most people now have seen it in plastic, but he, uh, he imagined that toy in wood and made that toy for the American Toy Company uh, for his entire life. That was one of his big contributions. His little brother was kind of jealous of that because that brought him some acclaim. So there's Jarvis Rockwell. Uh, up, up in the back, Norman Rockwell. Right there we see Norman Rockwell's dad. He worked at a textile mill in, uh, in the New York City area and was a middle manager. Um, Nancy, his mother, with the cat right there, she stayed at home to take care of the two sons. Now Rockwell's career with the Saturday Evening Post started in 1916, as you've probably heard three or four times if you've been here. And that was with the Saturday Evening Post uh, right here. You can see that first cover, that boy pushing the baby carriage. Many of Rockwell's images had uh, uh, almost uh, autobiographical beginnings to them. This one, we can imagine Norman Rockwell as a little boy moving to Mamaroneck, New York, spending some time meeting some of the kids in his neighborhood and trying to make some friends. And one way you might be able to do that is to play baseball with the kids that are in your neighborhood. Mr. Rockwell wasn't a perfect, perfect athletic specimen. Um, far from it. He actually wore eyeglasses and he was a little knock-kneed and he was thin for his entire life. So he oftentimes found himself left out from these baseball games when they would choose sides. So he realized that if he brought his sketchbook with him, he could draw pictures of the boys as they played baseball. And then at the end of the game, he would hand those pictures out to the kids that he'd been playing, with, the kids that had been playing. And Rockwell would go on to say in his autobiography that pretty soon the kids didn't want to play baseball unless Rockwell was there drawing their pictures. Right? So Norman Rockwell, as a young person and as an adult, was kind of shy. Actually, he was very shy. So imagine the opportunity you would have at 22 years old to be able to have a million or two million people looking at your artwork on the cover of a magazine. You finally found a way to communicate with people um, very, uh, in a very unfettered way. Norman Rockwell also painted images that showed kids just having fun, going swimming in that case. You can see that those boys probably weren't supposed to be swimming, but they definitely had a good time of it. So much fun that the dog is uh, so excited about running, he has all four of his feet off the ground at one moment there. So Rockwell often giving us those details to help us see that the adventures, even if they're small, can be very memorable. Another adventure that the Rockwell family would take, they would take uh, summer vacations and they would travel all the way upstate New York. They might go as far north as White Plains. 
So they really didn't go very far. <laughs> and that would have been very typical for a family at that point, just get out of New York City, even if it's uh, 35 or 40 minutes outside of the city, just to have a little respite from the heat of, uh, of an urban area. And here they are, they've captured two little critters in their hands. I'm not sure if you can see them from where you're sitting, but those two little critters are frogs. So the Rockwell boys now each have a pet, and I can't help but think that Rockwell might have thought about that when he created this image right here with that little frog peeking out of the cardboard box. That image created in about 1930 for a Saturday evening post cover. And as you can see, it clearly says vacation on that poster, and you see a big uh, steamship there that they might have traveled on. Then we realize it's 1930, and it's the Great Depression, and folks aren't traveling like that. They're traveling like the family that's in front of the poster, maybe going for a one-day trip, single piece of luggage with them. Uh, you might notice at her, at her foot right there, you can see that black box. That's actually a brownie camera. And the neat thing about brownie cameras is you could take well, maybe 75 or 100 photographs with some of them. You'd send the camera and the film back to Rochester, New York, to the Eastman Kodak Company. And that company would develop and print your pictures and load the camera again with film and send all of that back to you. So if you're wondering why there's a certain generation that likes to take two pictures of everything, that's why, because you couldn't check on your phone if that picture came out right. If eyes were closed, a head was cut off, or you didn't get the right focus. So oftentimes you'll see folks taking second pictures of things that might surprise you they would take one picture of. So that's the brownie camera. As we go to the top of the picture, you might notice the ladies wearing a brand new red cloche hat. Those would have been the height of fashion in the early 1920s. All of the, uh, all of the it crowd would have had those hats, but they didn't really filter down to middle America, if you will, until about the early 30s. So she gets a brand new hat, and dad gets to wear her old hat. Notice that straw hat, if it was a man's hat, it would have had a flat brim. This one has a curved brim, which tells you it's a lady's hat. She also has some flowers that they must have picked for her, and she's holding on to a balloon that's very deflated. I think that Rockwell probably did that to give you the sense of time passing on their vacation. And even though Rockwell uh, would have definitely experienced this with his mother and father, it wasn't always the way with his own children, and we'll talk about that in a couple of moments. We see the brothers Rockwell over there again, Norman Rockwell without the dark tie, his brother Jarvis with the dark tie, and you can see there's just a couple of guys about town. This is probably in New Rochelle, New York, uh, where Rockwell lived for a portion of his life. The illustration uh, on this side is from about the same time, 1919. It's two sailors talking about the girl back home, as you can see the photograph in their hands. Uh, Rockwell was in the U.S. Navy Reserve for 103 days. Uh, in 1919. So he joined, uh, the war ended very abruptly, and he was out of the Navy. So jokingly, we like to say that maybe Rockwell was the one that helped us win World War I. Probably not true, but we like to say. Now you wonder, who's that person in that photograph in that sailor's hand? That's Norman Rockwell's first wife, Irene O'Connor. They married three years previously. They stayed married for about 13 years, divorcing in 1929. Uh, Rockwell here also is sharing the Saturday Evening Post cover with a lady named Edith Wharton. Uh, Edith Wharton, who wrote Ethan Frome and pretty much everything else from the early part of the 19-teens, is publishing in this magazine um, for one reason and one reason alone, and that's a $700 check. That's why she's publishing, the only time she published in the Post. And it was a little gotcha to her manager who had, uh, I'm sorry, to her editor who had wanted to re-edit her pieces that she was sending back from World War I. And she said she didn't want that to happen, but she needed the pieces published, so she went to the Post. They published them, they chopped the pieces up, she barely could recognize the story, but most importantly, the check cleared. So that was her focus at that point. You'll also notice as you go through uh, all of the 323 covers here, there are people like P.G. Woodhouse, Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, and Mussolini all writing for this magazine. So quite an interesting grouping of people who are contributing to the Saturday Evening Post. As we continue on with the Post, we see maybe the, one of the most direct references to adventure for Rockwell. Here we have that uh, ordinary clerk who's dreaming about how exciting it would be to be in a pirate ship. And then next week when you get your magazine um, delivered to your home, we see a pirate 
wondering what it would be like to have an average ordinary home in an everyday life. So Mr. Rockwell really giving us sort of both sides of the story. And he would do that with the post a half a dozen times, and I'm sorry, about three times during his career. And in this instance, we see, again, maybe a small trip, but a memorable one. The young man coming home from college, right, bringing his dirty laundry home with him, right? So uh, the family could take care of his laundry, but we could see how excited the family is that he's home. Uh, Norman Rockwell posing as the dad in the background with a maroon tie. Mary Rockwell, his second wife, posing, hugging her eldest son, Jarvis Rockwell. So that would have been Jarvis Rockwell's nephew, or Norman Rockwell's eldest son, as I said. Tom Rockwell right there in the plaid shirt. Over in that corner, you can see a little bit of a green, a guy with a green tie and uh, cat's eye glasses. That's Peter Rockwell, and you've seen his work already. It's on our grounds here. He's a sculptor. He lived in Rome, Italy for a great number of years, and now he's moved to Massachusetts, so he's back uh, in the United States. Tom Rockwell has written a number of children's books. One's called How to Fight with a Girl and Win, and he wrote another book called How to Eat Fried Worms. And uh, uh, about 14 years ago or so, they made that into a movie, which we thought was, was really fun. Jarvis right there, you'll have a chance to see a little bit of his artwork upstairs. If you go into the gallery where we have the virtual reality demonstration, look behind that television, you'll see that large installation there. It's actually an installation that Jarvis did here while we were open, and he was approaching 83 years old when he did it. And when he talked about that piece of artwork, he said that that was um, a journey in the afterlife. So a little bit of an adventure for Jarvis Rockwell to create that image. Again, while we were open and people were walking past him, talking to him, it was quite a fun thing to see. So sometimes, as I said at the very outset, sometimes the journeys are not about where you're going, but about where you're thinking about going. And in this case, we see some of the development, developmental pieces that you might have noticed upstairs. Over here, black and white photographs. Rockwell using about 75 to 100 photographs for this one image. He does a color study which you can see uh, upstairs as well. And then the finished work we see here is a Saturday evening post cover. And what Rockwell has to do is he has to think about all, the, all these different things that will add to the story. And so he changes the boy's shirt. He actually had a striped shirt on when he posed. Um, the bag that was down on the floor, you can see he actually had it in front of the stool. And Rockwell moves that so you can see that this boy has run away from home. The police officer changes from the study where he's smiling, sort of enjoying the story of the boy running away from home. And the bottom, the finished work, actually shows the police officer looking a little bit more seriously, listening to what the boy has to say. I have to say, I like to imagine that that little boy ran away because he couldn't get chocolate chip pancakes that morning and thought he'd find them somewhere else. The police officer that posed was a Massachusetts State Police officer, and he got in trouble for this picture and not in the way you might think. When the cover came out, we can clearly see that uh, in the police officer's pocket, he has a brown book. The Massachusetts State Police are very proud of their uniforms. They're the oldest state police organization in our country. And they issue their officers black books to, to go in their back pocket. They need to take notes, what have you. Um, when this came out, Richard Clemens, the police officer, was called to his commanding officer, and then his commanding officer, finally the colonel, got involved in the story and asked him, why didn't you have your book that was assigned to you in your pocket? And Dick had to say, I did. I had it. And there it was, my black and white book, and showed him the book that he had. And Mr. Rockwell had to admit that it, he changed it, right? Because now you can see the contrast of the brown against the blue pants. Since this cover came out in 1958, September 20th, the state police in Massachusetts all have brown books. You can test a theory on the Mass Pike if you want. Get going a nice speed, they'll find you, no problem. And then you can ask them to look at the book, see how that works out for you. Uh, the state police are very proud of this image. And as a matter of fact, at the State Police Museum and Learning Center, um, in the other part of the, in the eastern part of the state, they have this image almost everywhere in the museum, which is kind of fun. So that's called the Runaway, an image that Norman Rockwell did, as I said, in the late 1950s. And it was giving us that feeling of what people were thinking about, not running away from home necessarily, but exploration, right? We're going to have the space programs going to start to open up. Uh, we're seeing the Soviet Union kind of competing with us a bit to try and see if we can get uh, something in orbit uh, over, the, over the planet. So this is more than just this little boy 
not getting chocolate chip pancakes. This is more about our culture changing and looking for change and encouraging change. So there's Mr. Rockwell right there, another form of transportation, the toboggan, which we don't have quite enough snow right now to be tobogganing, but maybe in a few days, who knows. Uh, that's Mr. Rockwell in the studio that we have on these grounds. He referred to that studio as his best studio yet. That was his final studio, and it was right in the middle of town, just behind his home on South Street in Stockbridge. Uh, when he passed away, and then when his wife Molly, who I'll talk about quite a bit later on, um, when she passed away in, in 1986, we actually moved the studio from its location out to these grounds. So when you come back in the summer and help us celebrate our 50th anniversary, uh, you can visit Norman Rockwell Studio. We'll have it open and ready for you. So sometimes adventure, again, is a little bit more about what's going on. And we see that these five kids are probably going to have some adventures as things continue for them. Uh, we obviously see their difference in their skin tone, but we also see a lot of similarities there, too. We see that the boys like baseball. If we look really carefully, we'll see that this boy has a catcher's mitt, and those two boys have fielder's gloves, right? So they're going to need one another. We see that, that the two little girls, they both have pink ribbons in their hair. They both have pets, right? And then you might notice that one of the pets is a white cat, and the other pet is a black dog. And then you might notice, as you're looking at this picture very carefully now, that the cat in this picture is the aggressor, not the dog. So it reminds us that we can very easily be lulled into doing something that uh, may be not what we're actually seeing. We can kind of deceive ourselves occasionally. Uh, we see two adults in the painting. There's one in the window in back and another gentleman loading the truck. Can you see? I'm going to just point to her, right up here, point to her or him right up there. So the Gladys Kravitz there, right, looking out the window, wondering what's going on next door. Who's moving in? They're not going out there to bring a tray of chocolate chip cookies or a cake or a pie or anything. They're going about their lives as their lives always have been. And so this is Rockwell hoping that this next generation will bring some change forward. This was done in 1967. So 52 years ago, Rockwell's hoping that's the generation that will make some changes as we move forward in, in, our, in our country. So again, adventure on a slightly different scale. Um, here's a scale you might have been thinking about, Rockwell working for the Peace Corps. And he's in Africa trying to train someone to use a new plow. And this is again in the 1960s. And what the Peace Corps did was offer people an opportunity, offer different countries an opportunity to have uh, somebody, a group of people come from the United States to help them out if they had any questions or problems that they saw. Rockwell actually went to Bogota, Colombia and illustrated the fact that they needed a new water system there and the Peace Corps helped them do that. So Rockwell traveled uh, again all over the world. Here he is in Russia, Soviet Union at that point. And what Rockwell did was he set up shop kind of on the side of the street and would ask people if they would be willing to come and pose and he would paint usually their portraits. Rockwell also got trouble when he was in the Soviet Union. He actually almost got locked in the Hermitage while he was there looking around and lost track of time. And they were about to close and they realized he was still in the gallery. So he really enjoyed his time uh, in the Soviet Union for sure. So he also had the opportunity, as I mentioned at the very beginning, to do some work um, for the space program that showed what the space program was doing. And here we have Grissom and Young getting ready for um, their experience in space, which of course um, was a tragic one. So adventures all around Norman Rockwell, um, even in 1969 when Rockwell would have been advanced in years, he was born in 1894, he was asked by the federal government if he'd be willing to paint a picture of the Glen Canyon Dam. And so one of the things the government thought might be a good uh, way to use this project is to encourage people to go to Lake Powell. So they could bring their power boats there, go swimming, um, just have some family time together. And they asked Norman Rockwell if he'd paint the picture, and he agreed to do that. But he said he had to go out to Page, Arizona to see the dam and have photographs taken of it. So here he is sitting down, and there's Molly, his third wife, taking the photographs of the dam. Some of you might have seen the original painting upstairs on display toward the back of the museum. Um, it is on loan to us from the Bureau of Land Reclamation. 
And again, the next photograph over, we can see Molly taking a picture of her husband in front of the dam, a profile shot there. And then we see at the bottom part of the screen, we see the picture that Rockwell turned in. Keep in mind the Bureau of Land, Rec Land Reclamation, which is hard to say, um, was not very excited about using this to encourage people to get out to Page, Arizona. After all, when Rockwell met that family of Navajo, um, they explained to him all of the bad things that have happened after this dam was constructed. It was a hydro dam, very, very large structure. It's 710 feet tall. And when you look at it in this picture, it kind of looks like it might be a very big curb. So Rockwell has set it all the way back in the picture and it has focused us on the important part of life story, and that's people. And in this case, people that didn't have voice to be able to use of their own. So again, Norman Rockwell in 1969 turns this picture into the government. Um, there wasn't much they could do about it. They had already made the contract, so they took the painting. And it usually lives in a welcome center in Page, Arizona. And uh, during the Obama administration, we actually asked to borrow the painting and the government was very willing to loan it to us. So we're very happy to have it on display here to tell another aspect of Norman Rockwell's work. So in 1956, um, probably the most obvious adventure that Rockwell would, would catalog would be his trip around the world uh, thanks to Pan Am Airlines. And this would have been the opening image you would have seen in the Saturday Evening Post or the other magazines of their time. On the far side is one of their um, brochures about Pan Am Airline. Um, they're the most experienced airline in 1956, apparently. Um, they also had the only opportunity to fly from New York to London, and you would do that on that airplane right down there in the bottom corner. They call it the President's Special. And it was one of the only ways you could get from New York to London at that point at a fairly rapid speed. They gave Norman Rockwell an opportunity to fly on that plane to start his tour in England. And as you look at these images, you might be able to pick out some of the places that he went to. Uh, this one right here, of course, referring to England. And as we progress through, we see some other uh, items that might key us into different areas. Notice the camels, the women uh, dancing, uh, probably in France. Uh, we see a tea ceremony uh, here in the foreground. And then over there, we see Rockwell traveling to the protectorate of Hawaii. Because keep in mind, Hawaii won't be a state for three more years. So we're, they're trying to encourage people to fly to Hawaii so they can make a little bit more money off of people traveling. It's a business after all, Pan Am. Uh, there's Trafalgar Square. Then right down here, we see the Treby Fountain. And uh, we can see Norman Rockwell actually sketching in that picture the Treby Fountain that he'll paint for this advertising series. You've noticed that blue bag showing up quite often, right? When you would fly with Pan Am in the 1950s, 60s, and into the very beginning of the 70s, they used to give you a little blue bag that had some personal items in it and uh, a place where you could put your sweater if you were too warm. And it served as an advertising piece for them, too, because when you left the airplane, you took that with you, and you could show people you've been on Pan Am. And that was a good way for them to try and get people to continue to fly. When you look carefully at this image on the top here, that's a pencil sketch that Rockwell had done when he was in Pakistan. We actually have the pencil sketch in our collection, and it's, um, let's see, it's about as big as three rows up of those post covers, and maybe six post covers across. Very, very big pencil sketch. And we see from that pencil sketch how Rockwell corrected his work. If he made a mistake, he cut out that piece of paper, get rid of that little section of paper, paste another piece of paper there and continue drawing. Right, so if you guys are all impressed at how you use cut and paste, Rockwell was doing that in the 50s. <laughs> so here we are. So we have the sketch here, a color sketch right there, one of the photographs from the photo shoot um, over there. And if you notice very, if you look very carefully at that photograph, you'll see they're actually sitting in airline seats, which Rockwell had borrowed for a series of photographs for uh, this assignment. So this, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, the picture on this side isn't very clear, but I, I had to add it in because I, I love that picture of Norman Rockwell showing the rickshaw driver, how to pose as a rickshaw driver. I just thought that was a great detail. <laughs> and you can see that over there. And just as Rockwell did when he traveled out to Missouri to do the uh, Tom and Huck series, um, he was offering to buy clothes off of uh, the rickshaw driver's back so he could have the real thing to paint from when he returned home. Rockwell um, 
continue the series with this image, again showing Hawaii up top, showing a little bit more of, uh, of the Asian continent over there, and then an uh, individual photograph that Rockwell would have had of uh, one of these outriggers moving through the ocean. Because Rockwell is not going to do a sketch out in the middle of the ocean, he's going to put you on the beach. He's going to take the outrigger, prop it up there, and take a series of photographs so we can get each of the models just right. And if you notice um, the gentleman there with the bag on his knee, that bag is in perfect position, so when you look at the image, that bag jumps out at you. It's an ad for an airline. That's, the, that's what he's trying to do here, get you to see the airline. I love the fact, though, that their hats aren't even twisted aside or anything after being tossed through this uh, very rough wave. So this was kind of a tricky thing. We see Rockwell getting off of that Pan Am airliner, greeted by uh, some ladies at the airport. Rockwell thought it was wonderful that they would give you a lay of flowers when you got off the airplane. He commented on that a couple of times in his autobiography. Then you can see a photograph Rockwell's taking. We can actually see him right there, his shadow. He's taking a picture of that gentleman. But we notice when we look at the ad, who's under the umbrella? Norman Rockwell. He, that's himself there under the umbrella with the ladies as they lounge on the beach. Uh, Rockwell said that he was one of his favorite models. <laughs> uh, Rockwell also traveled to other places in Europe, certainly. We can see the, uh, the Pont Neuf there. We can see in Scotland uh, a mill. And then up top we can see Kensington Gardens. He traveled to see the Grand Tetons and painted them. Um, he also painted this picture. And so we see Rockwell, a very loose sketch here of, uh, of the mountains of the Himalayas. Uh, Rockwell was a great one for keeping in mind that you shouldn't let the truth get in the way of a good story. That was something that Rockwell often said. Um, and, and that's the end of our presentation right now. We're just showing you the exterior of our building. We are celebrating our 50th anniversary, as you've probably heard a million times as you step inside this building this year. And that's the studio, and I had that photograph included in this presentation because it's just proving to you that we do have times, a couple of days a year, where we don't have snow and it's not cold. Uh, those are some of our magnolia trees. I'm happy to take any questions that you may have. Um, there will be a fascinating presentation uh, in here when we finish up, and uh, Greg Manchus and Pat O'Donnell are going to do some drawing, uh, some live drawing demonstrations. Uh, also, if you've liked the experience you've had today, um, you can stop up at our information desk and check in with Tara, and you can grab a membership if you'd like to. It's a way that the museum can keep doing the programs that we like to do. It's also a way for you guys to connect with the museum to let us know what we should be doing. So we look forward to hearing your responses there. Uh, my name is Tom. If you guys have questions individually, come on up. We'll uh, answer those. If not, please enjoy the rest of your day here. Thank you. Thank you.